When I first set out to design the Decent Espresso machine, the first thing I did was to try and find a coffee mentor because while I was an amateur barista, I knew I did not know nearly enough to make good coffee. And so as I went seeking out these coffee gurus, this weird thing I noticed was none of them drank espresso. All of them drank pour overs. And I kind of wondered why. And so when Scott Rayo became my mentor and he said yes and he'd help me co-design this machine, I made my mission to convert Scott Rayo to drink espresso, pull him off of pour overs. And here's the ironic twist, is that pretty much as soon as I delivered this machine to him, Scott Rayo tried to figure out how he could make a pour over out of the decent espresso machine. And in fact, it took him about nine months to design a basket that made a pour over with the decent that was superior to what he did by hand. There's this meme online, which is hilarious, which is John, I'm gonna convert Scott Rayo to espresso and Scott, I'm gonna make pour overs on your espresso machine. So that's what we're here to do. Paul here is going to make a V60 pour over using the pour over basket that Scott Rayo has designed. So take it away, Paul. Yep, yeah, sure. We can achieve a pour over on the D1. And the first time I thought, how is that possible, John? And then at which point you showed me this peculiar little thing. It's very cute. It's just this tiny little basket and in it has these highly engineered precision holes that essentially provide the turbulence that is required for a great hand brew. Yeah, the turbulence and the spread. So what took Scott so much time and so many iterations is that he had to calibrate it so that the flow coming out of the machine created a jet, which then created turbulence, which was the right depth. And then he calibrated the width of each turbulence so that each hole then hit a different spot in the coffee bed so that the turbulence was the same everywhere. And essentially, think of like the world's best hair massage. <laughs> That's what Scott was trying to do to the V60 coffee bed. Yeah, and I think it's, it's with a, a certain level of technique involved, which is just a simple agitation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I too personally have found that the brews, even though it takes roughly the same amount of time as a hand brew, the consistency is just unparalleled. Yeah, because I don't think you can achieve this circular agitation, right? When you're doing a V60, you're pouring like this, and you're only agitating where you Pour. In fact, one of the key insights that Rayo had did not come from Rayo at all, but came from Jonathan Gagne, mm -hmm. who has written a book about this very topic. And he found the ideal pour-over height. And the pour-over height that was ideal was one where laminar flow was still continuing to occur. And so you lift up your pour-over basket. And the laminar flow is where water is like one continuous stream. And when it starts to break up, you no longer have laminar flow. So the ideal pour-over height was where laminar flow was still happening but about to break up. And that's exactly what the hole size here is set to. So all credit to Jonathan Gagne, who created the insight that Scott Rayo then borrowed and engineered into this basket. I think let's just get right to it, John. Yeah, let's do that. Um, uh, I'm a little bit caffeinated today, but I, I think I need some more. <laughs> right. so, so I see we've uh, set up the niche for a coarse grind. We are currently what? We are at about 37 and a half? Yeah, 38, 37 and a half, 38. Okay. And, it says um, filter drip, so I guess this is what it's made for. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, it's a very good point. Um, the, uh, the niche does have the words on the side, but uh, I always like to say this, every grinder is a little bit different. Mm. So uh, just get the sort of rough movement of how much it was uh, and for everyone else from the last espresso we did it was around the 12 maybe 13 mark and we've gone all the way to 38 so when you are doing a pour over on the D1 um, it is good to have in mind that there is rather a big grind change and some purging of the grinder may be required Okay. Uh, okay, later on we're gonna talk about why you think this grind is the right size, not yeah. coarser or refiner. Sure, sure. All right, so show me what you're gonna do here to make okay. a V60. So, of course we need the D1 and the pour over basket. You've yep. got a filter, your V60, a cup underneath, mm -hmm. and the pour over basket mounted here. That's right, so uh, I've just primed it all to be uh, pre-wet the paper, obviously to get rid of any paper taste, but also to give my equipment a bit of a preheat. Um, some of you may notice that I have a plastic V60 cone here and um, due to the physical properties of plastic, it's a better insulator of 
heat and you will find that the temperature stability using a plastic V60 cone is much more stable as opposed to a ceramic or any other uh, material. So you think you have a lot less heat loss when you use plastic versus metal. That makes a lot of sense. Yes, yeah. Um, so, you know, you don't have to use the D1. You can just pour hot water in, have it over a cup. Um, sometimes I have it over the kettle and just leave it in there while I'm prepping. And That's one less thing since the flush is actually at the same temperature you're going to make a V60. That's right. And um, it's also a good time to check your flow um, to see how the shower is moving. Um, I did notice a little bit of movement there, so I'm just going to give my group head a wipe. And a so by movement, what he's talking about there is that as the water is coming out through the holes, there is a little bit of residual coffee grounds in there, and they're slightly blocking the holes, which is so the water is jittering a little bit. Nothing really terrible about that. It's just not optimal. The other thing I'd like to notice, the drip tray has been removed and he's put the drip tray, you can't see it quite, but it's on the bottom here. And that's so that the V60 has plenty of space. Mm -hmm. Otherwise the drip tray here is not giving us enough space to put our vessel in. That's a very good point. Uh, it's something I did miss out. And the drip tray at the bottom is just to keep the hole on the countersink uh, mm -hmm. open. Um, but if you don't have a countersink, um, you can actually put the, not have the drip tray there and just have a little shot glass to catch any water that may be coming out. And you'll still find it's still a very effective way of me. I've pre-dosed some coffee here. It's a just a Colombian and it's 15 grams. Uh, That's to very match. light. Yes, it's super light. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't smell chocolatey. It's and got doesn't a smell lot chocolatey. of fruit. This is 15 grams, and it's pre-weighed before. And we will uh, dose into the niche cup, because what you'll find is if you dose directly, you kind of get a lot of uh, grounds that will you know, climb up the edge, and those grounds will essentially not ever get bruised. And those are probably going to be either chaff or fines coming yes. on the side. Whereas if you grind the here, you can homogenize it. That's right, yes. And you can actually get a lot closer um, and you'll find that your bed that of coffee that you will make uh, will be a lot flatter and all the grounds will be used in the extraction itself. So I notice here you're doing something unusual, which is you're spinning the cup as you grind and that's to pre-homogenize it? Is that yes, what's going on Yes, that's right, that's right. Um, okay. I found this is a little bit more effective rather than shaking. Um, this is my own personal preference. I find when I shake, um, I just get a big clump inside sometimes and, and while you can do it with a puck rake, we won't be doing a puck rake on this instance, but I have seen some other people use it. Um, but I just want to keep this whole process simple. So that makes a lot of sense also because with a coarser grind, essentially it's like panning for gold. We've got fine and coarse particles. Yeah. And if you're going to shake it, you're going to move all the fines to the top and the coarse to the bottom. That's right. We will start to go ahead and put the grounds in. I will tilt this to a slight angle just to give me a little bit better access and you just want to do this in one motion, okay? And then right at the end just tap it and as you can see all my grounds has gone almost straight into the middle bar this bit but not to be worried about and then we will just do a simple forward motion and side motion just to flatten the bed. I would do this just to smell it. It smells <laughs> fantastic. Yes, yes. Okay, and as with all V60 brews that I do, um, I create a little divot and I just use the thermometer. Uh, but you can use your finger if you want, but we will be a slightly more hygienic today. Um, but the main goal in making this divot is to create an even sort of wall, to, so to say, and not to compress the grounds further inside the actual dose itself. So now that is done, that is prepared, we'll just need to organize the milk jug at the bottom um, to catch uh, our coffee that has been brewed out, much like a carafe, and we will be preparing to start the extraction. Now, um, there is one thing I'd like to point out here. We, you may notice that I have actually modified my V60 cone here uh, in that I've cut pre-cut the paper maybe around one centimeter mm -hmm. from the edge just so I have enough clearance here and I've not got anything that may interfere with my extraction. In a moment, you will see me do agitation. You will kind of know what I mean by this edge here. Just from previous brews, this is something that I always mind mind out for. Okay, so this is the profile. It's the V60 15 grams in, 250 out, and we shall start. So um, as it starts, you can see immediately it comes out and immediately I'm agitating these grounds. And what I would like to point out is it was quite aggressive and from the side you can kind of see the crema but you can also see how high I have made my swirl. Now it's an important note to make during the bloom stage not to make the overall level of your agitation too high um, for the reason in that 
those grounds have a potential not to make it into your brew. The second reason being you don't want any excess bypass at this point. Having less bypass will essentially create a higher TDS brew for you. So I note that and everything is like being massaged crazily. Yes. Uh, it's all bubbling and gurgling beautifully mm. and it's going kind of within like half a centimeter of the edge. Mm. And each of these steps is happening automatically. So Paul is not prompting this. Once he hits mm. start, he agitated during that pre-wet and now each step is a pause and then the next step and we're just watching it happen. Uh, so could you run this more or less manually once you've done that initial agitation or yes. how automatic could this be? I mean, if you're really going for the, the stellar brew, mm -hmm. um, I would suggest agitating at each step mm -hmm. and your most vigorous would be at the start and you would almost have uh, just a slight swirl towards the end. For the reason you just want to achieve a flat bed, so when you have the drawdown, you've almost got like all the brew water going through the coffee bed. Mm -hmm. If you just did the agitation at the start, there is a possibility you will see a slight ring of coffee around the edge of your V60 cone, and that's just for the reason that those haven't been pre-wetted enough or have just not had enough steep time. So before anyone asks, one of the things we did in R&D was to see if we could automate that swirling, and the way we did that is we bought a little jeweler's turntable that we put underneath the V60 that caused it to spin. And essentially what we found is it was just too slow and all it did was just look nice visually but not increase the quality of the brew at all. So at least right now there's no secret formula other than getting your hand in there and just giving it what's called the Rayo swirl which is a standard technique now in the V60 repertoire. Now the brew is actually finished. It finished in 132 seconds, so just over two minutes. I have a range of four minutes to five minutes for the brew. So from four minutes onwards, um, there is a little countdown. So we can kind of see in the time section, the last value is still going up. So it's at now at 43 seconds. So that's your timer to know when the extraction should have finished and you can start tasting. I like to start tasting at four minutes, especially if you it's your first brew. It's a very high chance that you may need to make adjustment. Um, luckily I have dialed this in, so fingers crossed that it should taste good. Um, but in the cases where it may not be, um, tasting at four minutes, you really get a sense of, have I pushed my extraction too much? Have I, could I have extracted more? And um, you can actually taste taste the remaining brew that is left in the cone in a separate cup and you can see what would have that have added to my final brew. Uh, and if you're really curious, you can just add it one teaspoon at a time and, mm. and just see it that way. One of the things I'm noticing is there isn't a whole lot of coffee grounds sticking to the sides. Mm. It seems like it's settled yes, nicely. Yes. Um, and, and I've noticed that's not always the case when I make a V60. Is that no. a good or a bad thing? Um, it can be a few things, um, mainly to do with your uh, grinder and perhaps how much fines it may produce. Okay. So if you are noticing a lot of grounds on the outside, especially like this, where it's almost looking like a, almost like a chocolate paste, you can go a little bit coarser, but I would use your uh, brew time as a reference, okay? So I've come up to 120 seconds now from my extraction, so I'm just gonna take this off. I'm just going to slide it over and put it into this cupping cup here. We can kind of see what John was talking about in that there is some coffee on there, but it isn't a lot. Um, essentially, we can say this coffee has had less extraction. Um, and that's what I mean by the agitation and the drawdown. Hopefully, we will get a flat bed, which looks like we've got a pretty flat bed, but I have moved it since, so it may have moved it a little bit. But let's try this brew right now. Now, do we know that the grind is appropriate because of the drawdown time? Uh, yes, so it was pretty much in range. So it just finished at 160 seconds. So that was just over two and a half minutes. So just to be clear, um, what Paul's doing is on the tablet, it shows you how long the original extraction took and then it says done for how many seconds. So he's reading the timer on the screen to know since the hot water has been finishing pouring, mm -hmm when the drawdown should have finished. If I lift up here, you can kind of see the remaining uh, brew that didn't make into the final cup, mm. which you can taste later on to see if you could just let it draw out all the way or it was right to So your concern off. is that this might be over extracted? Possible, um, but I think judging from the way of the drawdown and the time and the time I was aiming for between four minutes and five minutes, um, I'm pretty confident that this will be a pretty decent brew. All right. 
And do we think the difference in color is just the depth of the liquid? Uh, most likely, yes. Um, in fact, it, I'll be interested to see what you taste out of there okay. um, compared to this. Um, this one, I would suspect this one will be just sweet, mm. uh, not much flavor, but uh, and very thin body, but this will be much more intense. So what is this coffee we're drinking? This is a Colombian and it's a honey process. Um, I picked this coffee because now that we have filter 2.1, um, I'm finding I'm using filter 2.1 for really clean, super high quality brews mm -hmm. because I like to drink them over a long time. But um, obviously this is a light coffee as well, mm -hmm. but my preference is cleaner. And with the V60, it gives me more leeway to get a better brew. Leeway, I mean something that I will enjoy more of as opposed to um, in 2.1, I probably get a good brew, but it may not have been as interesting as a V60. Mm -hmm. um, but that's my own personal taste. Um, if it was a wash coffee, um, I still would have tried it as a V60, but I would probably be more inclined to use it as a, as a 2.1. The very first thing I noticed with this coffee is just how clean it is, right? I don't have any generic coffee flavor. It's quite delicate. It's got this beautiful floral characteristic on the nose and no silt, no cloudiness on the mouth. Um, and you're right about the color, John. The color is quite beautiful. Not quite red, but almost like a, 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 an orange around the outside. And even though this was a light rose, the acidity is really under control. There's none of that biting acidity, none, none of the uh, defects in roast either. In fact. Uh, I mean, who's the roaster for this? Because I think they've done a nice job. It was Ford Coffee. Oh, okay, yeah. Ford Coffee. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Colt Road, <laughs> yes. um, for a uh, beautiful coffee. Um, is this has it been open for a while since he came a few weeks ago? Yes. Okay, it's still expressing itself really nicely. In fact, it's it's matured um, very nicely, um, and I, I think it's more uh, open now mm -hmm. um, as it was before. But we have been keeping it in ideal condition, mm -hmm. so okay. backpacking it and keep it in stable. stable so condition. I have heard people talk about, unlike medium to dark rows, that lighter rows actually benefit from some maturing, some aging. Do you want to just talk about that? Yep. Yeah, sure. Um, what do I specifically mean by that? Is that um, when it was really fresh, because it was so complex, um, it was almost um, a little bit sort of, a little bit too much. Mm. Uh, that's the best way to describe it, in a good way. Um, this but, is definitely mellow. Yes, yes. And as it ages, it mellows out a little bit and the uh, sweetness sort of goes a little bit and it makes it easier to pick out a lot of the other sort of more subtle flavors. Mm. Um, and what I liked about it now as it matured as compared to previously when I brewed it was that the origin is really standing out. Mm. Um, so origin being from Colombia and it, it to me it just screams out um, black currants, okay. and on the aroma, it has this really nice sort of unami olives. Okay, um, and and I, I, I don't know, it works really well, and it's it's super silky um, mm -hmm. in terms of the acidity. Mm -hmm. um, but whereas before, the acidity was like it was just taming the richness. Okay. So now I feel like the acidity is now complementing the flavors mm -hmm. and working more in synergy with each other. But. Yeah. Each of their own. Um. Well, much more simply, I don't have your background on, right. on this sort of coffee. I mean, for me, what I'm liking is this is touching both my heart and my my head. Uh, my body's going, oh, this is really, this is pleasant, this is easy to drink, I'm enjoying this as a warm beverage, that's just my heart. And my brain is going, mm, beautiful smell, lots of top notes, complexity. Uh, and, and so it's a beautiful brew that I would probably drink both in the morning, because my mm. body needs it in the morning, and in the afternoon where I'm awake and I want something a bit more interesting. Yes, yeah. Uh, in no way is this a generic coffee, but that's what you would expect from the source. Mm. Um, what is the coffee filter? Because I only get the vaguest speck of paper filter flavor in the water. So this is just the uh, number two V60 filter paper in the plastic bag. Okay. It's Previously, we were using the from slightly, Hario or? yeah, from okay. Hario. Um, previously, we were using the cardboard one, and and there are two manufacturing places, and supposedly there are slightly differences in the two. This is what we bought here, um, and it and it you'll recognize it because it will just come in this plastic bag, just the V60 coffee style. And it says Tokyo, all made over in it. Pet Japan. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so that's nice filter paper. That's one of my big complaints generally with filter brews is that you can taste the wet cardboard coming mm. through. All right, so now. I haven't finished all of mine because we want to give this a try. 
I mean, this is really strong on the nose. You want to give that a whiff? Oh, yes, yes. So this is the last sort of 10 seconds, the drawdown. Mm -hmm. It's got a bit more bite, but it's still beautiful. Mm. I don't think you need to cut no, that out I, at I all. No, I agree. So we could have let, let it do a full draw down. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's great because you've already drawn like how are you going to do the next brew. Mm. Um, and the best thing is because a lot of the things are automated, i.e. the pulse, the timings, the amount of water you need, it just simplifies the whole process and makes it more repeatable. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that is the temperature stability. Um, you know, I, I was probably quite um, challenged when I was like, oh, can it make a better brew than me? Um, and while you can achieve this similar level of quality, you won't be able to do it as consistently. Mm. Um, and I put it down to it's just the temperature thing that you're fighting. Mm -hmm. um, you can have those kettles that, you know, you put back on and it warms up, but you're still fighting that temperature deficit almost. So the D1 just takes all those major problems out of the way and you're left with the enjoyment of um, dialing in Mm -hmm. and then enjoying the brew. So once again, to make this, you will need a decent espresso machine, you will need our pour over basket, and you will use the pour over profile on the DE1. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Paul, for a delicious coffee. Thank you very much, John.